Season 2 Part 2 starts right where we left it. Rudy had just been cured of his impotence, and his proposal to Sylvie meant marriage was right around the corner for him. What this means for some of you, though, is that as much as you don't want to admit it, you're pretty much watching a romance slice of life right now. It's a point in Rudy's life where things are relatively peaceful, and his main focus is to support Sylphie whatever way he can. There was a bit left out with regards to how Rudy approached his current situation with Paul, but as far as cut content goes, the majority of it's relevant to the wedding and house. I mean, there was an entire section of the novel dedicated to its renovation, part of which included a complete repurposing of the secret room in the basement. So, as we take a look at that and the deeper mystery behind the original owner of the house, perhaps you'll find there was more to this episode than just Rudy's home life. Let's get started. Episode 37, My Dream Home, covering chapters 1-4 to four from volume 10 of the light novel. It was only once a month that Rudy and the others ever had to go to homeroom, and it just so happened that the day he was cured was the day before said homeroom. So, with a strut in his step and a weight lifted off his shoulders, Rudy would attend bearing a scent so incredibly strong that Linnea and Persena would actually have to plug their noses from it. We only saw the first part of their deliberation after, since in the novels the two went on into a serious discussion on who would become the boss's woman. It was a conversation Rudy initially thought they were having just to make fun of him, but after Persena stepped up as the one to take one for the team, Rudy knew he needed to put an end to it. Still, Persena would go and sit unusually close to him, and Lenia would stay far away as if to keep herself guarded. It was a weird sight since the two were acting completely opposite from how they usually did. In any case, it was once Rudy revealed that he'd finally been cured that everyone would stand up, clap their hands, and say congratulations to him. The sight was so incredibly peculiar yet familiar that Rudy couldn't help but relate it to the last episode of a certain TV anime, a word-for-word -word reference that I'm certain points towards Evangelion. That wasn't the only reference that should have been made this episode though, since a couple more were made during his conversation with Nanahoshi. Before we get to that though, it was while on his way to her that even Vice Principal Genius would take note of Rudy's new demeanor. He would inquire as to why it is Rudy seemed so different, and Rudy would respond by saying a three-year problem had finally resolved itself. This made Genius ask whether Rudy would continue to stay at the university, since the whole reason he'd even enrolled here was to find a cure for his impotence. With that now done and his personal mission complete though, Rudy thought perhaps now was a good time to finally head to the Beggarit continent. It was, after all, the place where his family was. It was when he considered everything he'd be leaving behind, though, that Rudy began to hesitate since so much had happened in the past year. He'd reunited with Zanaba and adopted Julie, bonded with Cliff and befriended the two Beast Girls, then even met someone who was Isekai just like him. Sylphie was of course what mattered most to him, but she probably wasn't the reason the man god sent him here. If he had to guess, Rudy believed it was also he could meet Nanahoshi. He felt their meeting was more than just a coincidence. That being the case, there was probably something important he was meant to find out with her. It wouldn't be the reason he'd stay here at the university though, since wherever Sylphie was, that's where he would go. This was the decision Rudy decided to follow through with. That didn't mean he'd go running to Asura if Sylphie did too, but it was certainly a possibility should the right circumstances be met. Like, one of the core reasons he didn't feel comfortable going anywhere was simply due to the fact that Paul hadn't yet responded to him. Until he got confirmation of the way things were on his end, Rudy would wait at the university just in case. To go anywhere else would mean he would miss Paul's reply, and that could be risky if something dangerous had happened. So, until he could touch base with Paul, Rudy was set to continue being a student. Now, it was during his conversation with Nanahoshi that the generational gap between them would be made apparent, specifically through the use of manga and anime references. What I mean is that, since the two never really had much to talk about, it was in the times they did that Rudy would try to find some middle ground. He would try to take advantage of their shared passion for manga and light novels. It was when he made a reference to Sailor Moon though that the blank stare he was met with highlighted their age gap. You see, not only did Nanahoshi have no idea what Sailor Moon was, but the follow-up reference involving Dragon Ball was something she'd only ever heard of. This was pretty surprising from a self-proclaimed avid reader, but when you consider how she was 17 and him 34, it was only natural the series they've read to be completely different. There was a complete gap in their ages that made conversation incredibly difficult. A generational difference that was only further accentuated by the 10-year gap between her arrival and his. This was why Rudy just blurted out the question about dating, since with nothing else to talk about, it was the only thing he could say. Now, 
One of the things Rudy thought about when recounting the quarrel with Nanahoshi was the potential of her running some sort of reverse harem, and the high likelihood that the two she was with were isekai'd as well. The lack of rumors made such a chance equally unlikely, but then again, to survive without mana would be, well, difficult. Unless you were lucky like how Nanahoshi was, to be thrown into this world with no support and no mana was essentially a death sentence. It was a thought that Rudy quickly realized Nanahoshi must go through daily. Moving on to the cafeteria now, despite Rudy being excited for his upcoming marriage, he still wasn't sure if it was appropriate considering the current situation with his family. That didn't really bother him too much though since whenever it did, he would just think about all the amazing things getting married came with. So, in actuality, the only real problem was the method in which marriages happened here. He'd never seen one himself, and since the one for Paul and Lilia was just a massive party, he couldn't say for sure what even went into the ceremonial part of a marriage. In fact, Rudy wasn't even sure if people had one here. So, Rudy would go and ask both Xanaba and Cliff, but in addition to neither mentioning a ceremony whatsoever, both would also give wildly different answers dependent to their culture. In Shirane, the man had to send gifts to the family of the bride, while in Millis, the bride was given a dowry to provide to her husband. Both emphasized a strong connection between the families, but neither had any particular type of event behind it. Even Xanaba, who'd already been married and divorced, couldn't provide insight other than the house stuff. Cliff also couldn't provide insight into Elvish customs, since in addition to Alina Lise not being the most, well, traditional, he had also promised the two wouldn't get married until he cured her. So, the most either could offer was financial assistance from Xanaba's side. He was more than capable of buying any house no matter how big and was happy to do so should Rudy request of him. Of course, Rudy didn't want to accept, but considering he had no idea what the current housing market was like, he decided to keep the option as a backup just in case. Fast forward to when he's actually looking at houses, and the place he was at was pretty much a real estate agency. Technically, it's referred to as the Land Management Office, but since their main purpose was the purchase and sale of vacant property, along with the occasional permit grants for empty plot builds, it made sense to just consider them the real estate agency. Normally, such tasks were handled by the region's liege lord, but with Sharia not having a regional lord at all, the duty was instead handled by the Magician's Guild and Three Magic Nations. They had worked together to create the Land Management Office and established it as its own independent group capable of distributing land without them. This would be who Rudy was dealing with, and it was here he would come across all sorts of homes he definitely couldn't afford right now. Sure, he could get a decent house or a relatively nice apartment, but anything posh was way out of the budget for him. Asking Sylphie was something we saw him consider too, but if he wanted to look dependent and fulfill his duty as the man, Rudy felt he needed to do this alone. That's when he saw the cursed manor at the bottom of the listings, and the entire backstory for that was given by the real estate agent. So, we already know who went in and who got murdered, but if you're wondering why the Adventurer's Guild stopped trying to cleanse it, the main reason was because the quest for it was stuck at the E-Rank. It was definitely far more dangerous than the E-Rank, but with not enough funds to raise the quest's rank beyond that, the Land Management Office found they couldn't make an enticing enough offer for anyone to take it. Especially since there was a bit of discord between them and the Adventurer's Guild. Rudy would then ask if he could get it for free if he cleansed it himself, but the moment he did, the agent just looked at him as if he was crazy. He would then sign a provisional contract instead and list Ariel and Bodyguardi as the guarantors for it. It was as soon as the agent saw whose names were on the paper that he would immediately stand up and go get his manager. Rudy couldn't be certain which of these names was getting him the special treatment, but it was clear one of them for sure made him someone important. Enough that in the subsequent negotiation with the manager, Rudy was able to bring the asking price down by half. This brings us now to Rudy's initial investigation, and despite the building being over 100 years old, it looks surprisingly well maintained given how long it's been abandoned for. It made Rudy think perhaps some kind of mana was infused into it, perhaps a type of mana which protected it from decay. This wasn't far-fetched considering that literally anything could be infused with mana, but as we find out later, a lot of the house's good condition was attributed to the doll. In any case, the three would investigate using a formation Rudy came up with himself. Xanaba would stick in front and be their tank, Cliff the middle since he was the most important, and Rudy the back as the tactician and DPS specialist. The reason I say Cliff is the most important is because it was only natural to protect the healer. Sure, he could provide a bit of divine offensive magic too, but what mattered most was keeping him safe as their support. 
Xanaba's weapon was one Rudy had actually crafted himself, since as Xanaba himself once said, normal weapons were simply too fragile. What I mean is that his superhuman strength always made him break them. This would mean replacing them would become quite expensive, so rather than do that, Rudy simply made his own for him. As for Cliff, his nervous demeanor reminded Rudy he had actually just come back from an adventure, one that he was genuinely curious to hear all about. Just in case you don't remember though, it was back towards the end of Season 2 Part 1 that Cliff would go adventuring with Alina Lise and the S-Rank Party Stepped Leader. Cliff wasn't so excited to tell him about it though, since apparently the entire time they just ripped into him. It was an awful experience Rudy was sure wasn't that bad, but for someone like Cliff it probably was. As a person who constantly proclaims themselves a genius, to be constantly criticized was probably quite the shock to him. It's likely he didn't know how to handle such an intense and hostile environment. Now, there wasn't anything peculiar during the investigation in the anime, but what Rudy found odd in the novels was the way the fireplace was set up. He couldn't pinpoint what it was that made it seem so weird, but there was definitely something about it which made it special. Rudy would then have Cliff investigate it for any magical markings, and sure enough there was a magic circle imprinted right on the inside of it. He didn't know what exactly that magic circle did, but a good assumption was that it helped to heat the entire house. You see, if this fireplace truly was a magical implement like how Rudy thought it was, then it probably served as a furnace bringing heat to all the rooms. It would be a significant stroke of luck if so since a tool like that was extremely expensive. The next rooms didn't have anything as peculiar as that, but Rudy did get caught up imagining how Silphy would be in each of them. In fact, the more he saw, the more his imagination ran wild at all the possibilities of what their home life would be like. So altogether, the main floor had two kitchens, two large rooms, four small rooms, and two toilets, making it seem like the entire thing was two houses connected into one. With the upper floor being two symmetrical wings connected to one massive bedroom, it really was more than enough for whatever fantasies Rudy envisioned for himself, of which there were certainly many. Now, it was as Cliff worried for Alina Lise and Xanaba Julie that Rudy too would wonder if Sylphie was waiting up for him. He did mention how he was going out, but not once did he say he was spending the night. This made him worry that Sylphie was waiting outside his room for him to get back, and that in turn made him want to run back to the university and leave a note for her. With the sun setting and night almost here though, by the time he did and got back, there was a chance Sanaba and Cliff would have gotten themselves killed. He was after all the leader of their party, and if anything happened to them, it would be his fault. This made him reconsider the severity of leaving Sylphie in the dark, but at the same time led to what he knew was a dangerous mentality. What I mean is that if he justified the situation by saying it was only just this once, then who's to say how many more just this once's would come after it? It was a slippery slope that tended to accumulate, and one he knew would ultimately lead to a rift between them. This was something he really wanted to avoid, so the only solution he could come up with was to raise his own death flag. Thus the reason why he made this statement here to Xanaba. It wasn't something that was explained in the anime, but the only reason he said it was to force a trope on himself. A death flag he instantly regretted the moment he raised it. In fact, with the way Xanaba responded and the way he reacted, Rudy felt if he took it any further he wouldn't even make it to his wedding. His death flag would have been so ridiculously high that he wouldn't have been surprised if a bullet came out of nowhere and killed him right here. It was all a funny bit of subtext that made this conversation a bit more light. The investigation at night proceeded pretty much as we saw, but if you're wondering why it is Rudy's stone cannon didn't affect it, the main reason is because he had weakened it. He knew anything stronger would damage the house, and out of concern for doing damage which couldn't be repaired, Rudy weakened his projectiles right at the last moment, resulting in the attack only staggering the doll. Now, we saw Rudy's applications for it reach all the way to silicone, but what he didn't mention were the others in between all that. Like, he knew inanimate objects such as armor could move the same way that this doll did, but if that could also be applied to his own stone figures too, then the possibilities awaiting him truly were endless. It was when Rudy discovered the book in the basement after this that something about it just seemed super familiar. You see, from some memory or the other, both the crest and script were something he knew he'd seen before. The fact the text was one he couldn't read though, indicated the language it was written in was either Sea God Tongue or Sky God Tongue. That or a completely different language he'd never even seen before. Whatever it was that was being researched here though was clearly forbidden and abruptly halted. It was the only explanation for the routine the doll seemed to be taking every night. 
Rudy figured it was the magical implement responsible for keeping the house in the condition it was in. As for who it was who made it, well, there were a whole number of reasons for why they just suddenly up and vanished one day. The only thing Rudy knew for sure was that whatever it was, it was enough to cause them to leave their work behind. There's a bit more to who this potential person could be, and that comes with two weeks of cut content revolving around the house's renovations. A few days were taken to ensure no other robots were left, then a skilled dwarven craftsman was hired to make everything presentable. He was a 30-year veteran that went by the name of Balda the Hammer, a friend of Talhand whose achievements were known across the continents. He was introduced to Rudy through Alina Lise, and the two would take on this project of turning this ruin into a proper domicile. As it turns out, the whole thing was just a three-part process consisting of the door, washing area, and basement. The rest were just a bunch of touch-ups that didn't require much work at all. One of the observations Balda had made about the house in general, though, was that aside from the floors, everything else was made rather poorly. From what he could tell during the brief tour Rudy had given him, it was as if the house was made solely to hide the basement. To him, the basement was the part crafted the best, then everything else was clearly just extra. A quick construction project only done as an afterthought. Fortunately, the stairs, kitchen, dining area, and fireplace were all solid work too, but whatever talented builder worked to create all that clearly didn't do anything to assist with the renovations of the walls and ceiling. It was evident that this was where construction went haywire. This is where things start to get a bit more interesting, since upon closer inspection, Balda was able to spot a crest of sorts. You see, right on the fireplace which Rudy discovered was a magical implement was a similar emblem to the one he found on the book down in the basement. Baldo recognized it as the mark of a genius craftsman, but unfortunately the name of said craftsman was supposedly lost to time. That said, any magical implement which bore his crest was always sold for a lot since they were the best on the market. This was another stroke of luck for Rudy since an implement this big was incredibly rare. More importantly than that though was the fact that these implements were here meant that the original owner of the house likely built them here, making it probable he was the same person as that genius craftsman. I'm not sure if any of this information will end up being important later, but what is is what Rudy decided to do with the basement. We don't know for sure what it is he decided to do, but it was strange enough to get quite the comment from Balda. Something about Rudy clearly not being a follower of Millis. Machinery and materials were then brought in after, and the secret room in the basement was finally transformed. This would be the last thing before Rudy would finally bring Sylphie, and that brings us now to the end of the episode. So, yeah. That's pretty much everything you missed from this Scooby-Doo episode. If you're pumped for the return of Mushoku Tensei, then be sure to leave a like and let me know down in the comments. You can also come talk about it when I stream every Sunday, since that's where you'll find all the cut content early. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!